Good morning. We ready to go? Okay, cool. So, thank you for getting up early and coming to my presentation. Uh, my name is Chef, or Damon. I'll answer to a variety of things, as my wife will tell you. Uh, also, yes. Um, so, I am the technical director for NCC Group North America. Uh, we'll talk about them in a minute. Um, you know who my boss is now. Some of you do. Special thanks uh, to uh, NOLACON. Obviously, I mean, a lot of work goes into putting on a show like this. Um, it's a, a labor of love, I think, for everyone. So th this is my third time being at NOLACON. It's become one of my favorite shows. So thank you to everyone that's involved in that. Uh, I love my job because this is part of my job. I get paid to do this, which is amazing. So special thanks to my employer, NCC Group, <clears throat> my wife and editor, uh, she goes through all these decks and takes out the stupid dad jokes, and then I put them back in. Uh, but most of all, you. Uh, anytime, for any of you who have done public speaking before, the reason I love to do this is to support my fellow information security professionals uh, to try and advocate for the industry. Uh, but you, as much as I've done this, you're still terrified that no one's going to show up. So thank you for being here. Uh, especially on a Sunday after a, a wonderful party last night. Um, oh, right, the animations. There you go. Thank you. Yeah, I, I know, yeah. I'm, I'm a rookie. Um, all right, because I get paid to do this, you have to sit through this short commercial. If you're not aware, NCC Group is the company I work for. Uh, we're based in Manchester, United Kingdom. We've got 35 offices across the globe. Eight of those are here in North America. Uh, we're publicly traded on the London Stock Exchange, so please buy our stock. And uh, this is a slightly old slide, but in uh, fiscal year ending 2017, we did 313 million uh, U.S. in revenue. So that's the commercial. Please hire us. All right. Oh, speaking of hiring, we're hiring in Houston. So if you want to live in a different city than you are now or you're in Houston, uh, please come talk to me later because uh, we're growing faster than we can hire people. All right. So because of the uh, OSINT uh, challenge, I, I think some of you in this room know a little bit about me, but uh, that's me. Uh, credit to the uh, picture goes to Eli Owen, uh, photography. He took that at DEF CON last year. So I studied music initially at, at Louisiana State in Baton Rouge. Any LSU fans? Go Tigers? Hey, right on. Okay, good. All right. Uh, then figured out that in the music industry, 1% of the people make 99% of the money, and then I just fell into computer science. Uh, and 23 years later, uh, here I am. So that's a little bit about me. Okay, let's get into the story. So where, where did this come from? So I already mentioned that I used to be a gigging musician, and in jazz particularly, it, you know, you uh, hopefully your ensemble starts and stops in the same place. Um, but you spend a lot of time thinking on your feet. And as a consultant now for the last several years, uh, I realized that, that that skill of improvisation has actually helped me uh, quite a bit. And uh, I'm not going to read my abstract to you. That, that was just there to help me remember what I'm talking about today. Um, in information security, whether you're doing InfoSec for your organization or you're a consultant, that thinking on your feet, that improvisation actually turns out to be very, very useful. So let me just quickly poll the room. How many of you are consultants of some sort? All right, there's a handful of us. Okay. And the rest of you uh, presumably do InfoSec for your organization. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Who would hire you? Yeah. Um, so that's where this story came from. So now I'm going to walk you through hopefully some specific examples. Uh, to, and, and if nothing else, if it makes you think about, you know, how to be more effective as an information security professional than I, I think I will have done my job. So let me talk about uh, setting up this allegory here of improvisation uh, in jazz gigs. So the sheet music is kind of like the statement of work. And I'll show you an example in a second. So that tells you, you know, what you're supposed to be doing. And again, it, you know, the end goal is to start and stop at, at the same time. So as it turns out, though, what is on the page whether it's the sheet of music or the statement of work, is not necessarily what the client or the audience actually wants. The musician has to read the crowd, like I'm doing now. If I start seeing people falling asleep, then I know I've got to do something. Yeah, my wife is already, yeah, yeah. 
she's heard this before. Um, so specific examples of how we had to adapt to a changing audience in front of us. Um, when I was in undergrad, I, I played in a band. Oh, actually, no, I was still in high school. Yeah, we were hired to do a wedding reception, and we played Louie Louie at some point because it's an easy song, and people recognize it. So we played it, and you're like, okay, thank goodness that's over. And then the bridesmaids decided that they could sing it and make it better than just the instrumental version we did. So they said, play it again. Like, whatever, as long as we get paid at the end of the night. Well, so we played it again, and the bridesmaids did a horrible job uh, of singing it. Well, then the groomsmen, not to be one up, decided that they could do better than the bridesmaids did. So they came up and said, play it again. And I was sitting there behind the kit, I'm a drummer, and thinking, okay, when they talk about paying your dues, this is what they were talking about. Because going through that song one time is bad enough. And so we played it a third time. And But that's what they wanted. So that's what we did. Uh, as an aside, at the end of the night, we were sitting there waiting on, on getting paid. And uh, we hadn't packed up yet. <clears throat> By the way, gigging musicians, we pay, we, we play for free. We get paid for setup and teardown. That's the way it works. So I'm sitting there waiting on my money, and all of a sudden my drum set comes alive. And I'm like, huh, I'm the drummer, and I'm not over there. What the hell's going on? And it was the, um, the newly married uh, young lady was behind my kit. And that, so anyway, paying your dues. Uh, there was another time where we were playing at a blues bar, and the bass player, we were playing a swing tune, and right in the middle of the tune, he decided that this would be more interesting if it was a samba instead of a swing song. So the drummer is, if you're a right-handed drummer, the bass player is usually on your left. And so I'm sitting there swinging, and he said, hey, next time around, samba. I'm like, okay, whatever's clever. So we just went into a samba. Um, be, because we thought that would be interesting. And of course, the, the horn section in, in the front of us, you know, had no idea what was going on. They're like, okay, apparently this is a Latin song now. But it worked out, and because we were all used to improvisation, we changed without communicating with the whole group, uh, and it worked out. So when I talk about if you're not a musician yourself and you're wondering what does improv really mean, those are two examples. Um, oh, and also we're going to talk about silence in a minute. Um, Silence can be terrifying. Um, like, for example, as a public speaker, if I decide to stop talking for a minute. <laughs> right, right. But silence can, uh, as a consultant, can, can be uh, a useful technique. And we'll talk about that. Okay, so what does, let, let's make it a little more technical. What does improvisation actually look like? Does anyone know how to read music in here? Okay. Wow, it's, okay, I sh shouldn't be surprised because there's so many creative people uh, in computer science. So here's a chart, uh, sheet music, and uh, there's a lot of information on the chart. Let's see if this is going to work. So uh, actually, uh, one sharp, uh, so that's G major, uh, F sharp. Um, so in treble clef, this is in G major. Uh, it tells us what notes we're going to play. It tells us the lyrics that go along with it. All the information you possibly need about playing this tune is on that piece of paper. All right? Now, if you're the drummer, what do you get? Yeah. So, you see this? Oh, I forgot. I, I got bored last night, so I put in animations. Oof. Look at that. Are you impressed? See that? Say <laughs> That's the correct answer. See that section right there? I've got a bunch of bars, and they've got little slashes in them. And you probably can't read it, but at the top there's some words that says uh, Dixieland beat. Other than that, so if you're the drummer, you're like, all right, I guess I'll just play whatever the hell I want to. Because they, they're, you know, by the time you get to the rhythm section, the composer is probably bored and, and doesn't want to have to describe exactly. So in terms of improvisation, you know, you have to like, hey, well, I know where I'm starting, I know where I'm stopping. Other than that, it's up to me. So that's, uh, th this will make, stay with me, this will make sense in a minute. <clears throat> All right, so what's improvisation look like uh, if you're an InfoSec person? So we had a client who hired us every single year to do a, um, a an annual assessment of part of their environment. It was the same bloody gig every year, and you would think that, you know, over time the idea is we find stuff, then you go fix it, 
and then we'll go find different stuff. Well, if you work in InfoSec, you know sometimes it can take a really long time to fix problems. You know, it's not like you just say, oh, right, click a button and now the problems are solved. So we're basically giving them the same report year after year. And so we decided one year, like this is not really providing value. So we know what the statement of work says, but let's do something completely different and maybe give them some other things to think about in terms of the security posture of their network. Uh, so what we did <coughs> is uh, we were, you know, you enumerate a network, right? So we're scanning all the things. And we found all these Apple TVs. Now, we were in a conference room with a big, beautiful screen. And we're like, wow, there's all these Apple TVs. That's interesting. I, wa I wonder where they are. Like, where are they physically located? So we started looking around, and there was a cabinet that was unlocked. And we opened it up, and here's this huge AV stack of equipment, including the Apple TV that we found. And all these available Ethernet ports that were in there. And we're like, oh. The other Ethernet ports, by the way, were protected with um, with NAC, uh, <coughs> Network Access Control. So we couldn't really quickly do anything with those because we didn't have access to the certificate to get on. But we saw all this AV stuff, and we're like, oh, don't mind if we do. So we plugged in, and sure enough, we get an IP stack, and we have access to everything. And so that was the first place that we instrumented uh, our attack scenario was from their AV. So they had protected the business network quite well, but for whatever reason, the AV stuff was not protected at all. So it was just because we said, okay, we don't care what the statement of work says. We're going to do something different to try and help our client be better. And that's, that's how we did it. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, there was another gig where we were having a really hard time finding anything useful and you know we're not paid consultants are not paid by the finding right so I mean if a, a client's environment is uh, properly protected then that's good that you know then you let them know hey good job um, but you know again NAC was in play and every time we plug in uh, we couldn't get an IP stack because like I said we didn't have the supplicant um, but we managed to gain access to a, uh, an authorized device, a company laptop, because someone left it on their desk, and that was in scope, so we, thank you, stole the laptop, and uh, plugged it into the port, and sure enough, the supplement, if you know how NAC works, I mean, so it, it makes a broadcast and says, here's this certificate, please let me on the network, and then some routing and switching device heats up the port, and then you get access. So we thought, I wonder what happens if we plug in a switch first, and then plug in the authorized device. So the port heated up, we had access. Then we plugged in our unauthorized device. And as it turns out, the way they had NAC configured in their environment is it would only check for the supplicant one time. The first time it plugs in, it says, oh yeah, this is a good device, here's your ethernet port. And so even after we unplugged the authorized device, the unauthorized device continued having network access. And then we were able to instrument the test from that network access control port, and it, uh, it became wildly successful. But that was only because, in our frustration, we thought, okay, we need to be doing something different. Um, so that's my other example of improvisation. Uh, right, so silence and music. So it, does anyone like the symphony, classical music? So if you listen to a multi multiple movement piece, all the movements are part of one piece, so you're not supposed to clap in between movements, right? So when I was studying music at LSU, it would drive me nuts when people would start clapping after the first movement. And like, man, can you not read the program? There's three other movements in this thing. So it can be terrifying, but the, the reason I bring it up is because, again, whether you're a client-facing consultant, consultant or you're doing information security for your organization, um, you, you, have, you still have clients. You're supporting a business unit somewhere by doing what you're doing. And sometimes, um, as my wife reminds me, it's just, it's best to stop talking. Hey, wait a minute. I just told the story about the... Justin, you're just not paying attention, man. Okay. Uh, no, and so one of the challenges is, you know, we, we spend a lot of our job calling other people's babies ugly. And sometimes they don't like that. And so you have a finding and it has a risk rating, and sometimes they're not happy when you say, oh, this is a high risk rating because 
reasons, and often they'll ask, well, you know, I, I really think this is not the right risk rating, you, you should lower it. And my response is typically, <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't want to get in an argument with the client who's paying bills, so you just don't answer the question, because it's not our job. We observe things. We objectively report what we have observed. This is empirical data that we're giving to the client. It's up to them to decide and introduce the subjectivity of the context of that finding. So there may be a very valid business reason for a client to say, okay, fine, this is a high finding, but we don't care because. It's not up to us as information. Well, depending on your job, maybe you are responsible for mitigating whatever vulnerabilities you might find. Um, but in oftentimes the case is that it's up to them. So here's our observations, here's the findings, and then you do whatever you want with them. So I guess what I'm getting at, there's no point in getting in a philosophical debate about whether something should be fixed. Make your observations and then uh, then move on. Uh, so I mentioned statements of work. Uh, so here's an excerpt of a statement of work gig that I worked on recently. You can see I, all the text isn't there. Um, that's intellectual property, so I can't show you the whole thing. If you would like to uh, see the whole thing, uh, please take one of my cards and hire NC Secret. Shameful, shameful. Yeah, so so the problem with the statement of work, and we've seen one, so there's a lot of stuff on there that at a high level describes what sort of things we might do. I mean, this isn't a checklist. Um, and that's why I, I, statements of work can be tricky to write because, you know, as we're improvising through the engagement, we might not do some of these things depending on what our test cases reveal about the security posture of whatever it is that we're testing. So when I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, this is kind of like the sheet music, you know. We know what the client is paying for, um, but we may or may not do these things in that order or at all. Uh, for example, uh, I did a test at a marketing terminal once. Do you know what a marketing terminal is? Any oil and gas folks in here? Did, okay, yeah. So it's called a marketing terminal because, and this is not my client, by the way, so don't try and, you know, figure out who that is. This is, a, you know, shamelessly stolen from Google. Uh, marketing terminal is where the gas comes out of the tank and they put it in the tanker truck, and then they put additives in it, and then the tanker truck takes it to market. That's why it's called a marketing terminal. So the tanker truck takes it to a gas station, and then they sell it. So we were hired to do a vulnerability assessment of the marketing terminal with a huge caveat. This is operational technology. You can't touch the network. And we said, okay, what do you mean we can't touch it? Like, we'll do like really lightweight scans or passive scans or something. You're like, no, 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 no. You're not going to have Ethernet connectivity or any kind of connectivity at all. You're not going to plug in. And we're like, okay, how do we assess this thing? And they said, we're, we'll give you all the Visio diagrams you want. We'll give you the entire team that runs the, the uh, marketing terminal. And you've got a week. And we'll sit in there and we'll talk about how everything is interconnected and what potential vulnerabilities might exist due to the architecture of the system. Okay. So we showed up, and I had never done this type of engagement uh, before, so my boss met me in the parking lot, and um, we're about to walk in the door, and I said, hey, by the way, have you thought about, like, how are we going to do this? How are we going to be impactful for the customer when we, we don't have network access at all? And his hand was on the door, and he looked at me, and he said, I have no effing idea. And then... And then you walked in, yeah, and so I'm standing there right behind him, and I'm like, oh, bloody hell, uh, what are we going to do? We've got a week with these people, and we have no plan. And it's what he meant, it, it meant that he had no effing idea. What he meant was is that we have to start interrogating the client and gathering information before we can understand what our attack chain is going to be. It's just the way he said it kind of spooked me, as you, as you might imagine. So as it turns out, we sat down, and on day one, we started asking questions. You know, we had diagrams, and it's like you start off as like, they've been supporting this marketing terminal for decades, and we're just seeing this for the very first time. But as it turns out, that's okay, because 
they're not paying us to be experts about their environment. They're paying us to take advantage of the other environments that we've seen and kind of short circuit the process of learning what this architecture is doing for the business and for the technology and what um, improvements are theoretically possible. And as it turns out, uh, it was a wildly successful job. We found a printer um, that for whatever reason had two network interfaces on it and it was connected to both the, um, uh, the ICS network and the business network and that theoretically what was an interesting way that those two networks were bridged when they were not supposed to be interconnected at all. So we did have impactful findings even though we never had OSI layer 3 connectivity to anything. And, you know, we had to think on our feet. Like I said, you know, we had no idea. Uh, here's another good example. So I don't expect you to be able to read this. I know that text is kind of small. Uh, it, what's interesting about it is this was a nine-step attack chain. You know, starting at the top, we gained access to the network, and then each of those nine steps along the way, we slowly got more access to things. Um, and if you've ever been a part of a big uh, penetration test, you know, you start off with nothing, and the objective is that you have some unauthorized access of some, you know, the, the running joke is, yeah, we had domain admin by lunch. Well, yeah, you know, domain admin is one target that, that might be important. It's certainly not the only one. Um, but throughout this process, on step one there at the very top, you know, we plugged in to an Ethernet port, and then, you know, it was me and five other consultants who were like, okay, well, now what? And so then that starts, you know, you might have a playbook or you might have standard test cases that you use and, you know, how you enumerate your network, how you identify potential targets and all those sorts of things. But at the end of the day, I mean, it looks beautiful when you look at it now. It's like, wow, nine steps later and you've created your own domain admin account. But for every step along that way, there's that moment of horror where you're like, huh, I don't know what to do next. And you have to capitalize on your experience of having seen similar things before. Um, but I think that's an important concept that, you know, when you take training or computer science classes or whatever, we tend to overlook the creative element of, of what it is that we do. Uh, and this was a great example. We were so happy, obviously. Um, at the, it, we had like one or two days left on this engagement when we finally got domain admin. And uh, yay, and there was much rejoicing. Um, but Every step along the way, like I said, there was there was that moment of horror where we didn't know what to do, so we improvised, and that's what happened. So back to the forced music analogy I'm using when you're creating a set list. Yeah, thank you. Uh, know your audience. Okay, this set list happens to be what Pearl Jam played at the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Festival in 2016. Were you? Is that what they played? <laughs> uh, I'm shocked to hear that. Okay, yeah. Uh, so know your audience. I mean, what your set list looks like uh, at a, uh, a wedding reception, as I mentioned earlier, is maybe not the same set list you're going to use uh, in a blues bar or at Jazz and Heritage Fest or, or whatever. So know your audience. Know who you're talking to. Uh, as it relates to information security, when you're creating a statement of work, now, again, if you're doing SecOps, or some sort of uh, other internal support, may maybe you don't have to write statements of work, but you still need to communicate uh, with whomever your your client is. Uh-oh. Spooky. Uh, start at the top. And when I say the top, uh, if you like the uh, OSI model like I do, it's, it's not layer 7. I mean, technically, layer 7 is the top, but layer 8. Start at layer 8. That's the business. What is the business doing with the system that's being tested? They, they implemented the system for some reason. What is that reason? If you understand what the reason is, then you can under to hope to understand what are the value of the information assets that that system contains. Once you understand the value of the information assets, now you can start thinking about how the actual adversary might begin to attack them. Um, and beware of any business unit that already has a uh, test plan in place because I'm not saying that people would want to try and deceive us when we're simulating attacks on their systems, but sometimes they'll, you know, it's the whole diversion thing. Look at my hand here. Look at my hand here. Don't don't look at this over here. Um, so give yourself some autonomy and again think creatively and and don't 
limit yourself to whatever the statement of work might say. Uh, and, and also, the statement of work is a contract. For the consultants in the room, we always have this debate internally on how much information should actually be in the SOW. Again, we're not trying to be deceptive to our clients, but we w don't want to limit ourselves in what we're able to do. So, um, yeah, just be careful uh, what you put in your contract. So, in closing, expect the unexpected. What is the unexpected? It's that. Um, <laughs> I, yeah. S sorry, sorry, hon. I made some edits last night after you went to bed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Don't, yeah. Don't. You should be careful when you ignore your editor, like I just did. So anyway. All right. So the unexpected. We had an uh, ADFS, an Active Directory Federated Services engagement. Um, between, between the time that the statement of work was written uh, and we actually started the engagement, the entire project team had been replaced. And we didn't know that, and so we get to the kickoff call like two days before the gig was supposed to start, and the new project team was unaware that we had been hired to even do this, and in the interim, they made some significant changes to the environment such that it was unavailable. Like, I don't mean it was like, not production ready, like it wasn't there at all. Um, so we, you know, had to be flexible and creative and figure out how to instrument a test on a non-existent system. Oh, we will still, yeah, we had to reschedule it, but yeah, you, you know, um, yeah, I mentioned earlier, we're publicly traded, man. I got a board of directors that I got to keep happy and shareholders and all. Anyway, and there was a, uh, another example was there was a web app pen test, um, and it was scoped. Everything was described. They signed it, the, you know, all that stuff. And then during the kickoff call, uh, somebody new from the technical side had joined the, the client's team. And as it turns out, there was no web app at all. It was a browser plugin. And the, I mean, you can test a browser plugin, but the way you instrument such a test is completely different than an actual web app. Um, so we had to quickly scramble and try and figure out, you know, are we going to be able to do some impactful testing? Uh, I mean, th that was the first finding, which was, okay, the client is apparently unable to support their own system because they don't know what it is. Not, not to be cynical. I, I, we didn't actually write that up. But, um, but anyway, so expect the unexpected. Uh, our job as information security professionals is to use systems in unexpected ways to achieve unexpected results. Right. That's what we do. Engineers design things, and they assume that people will use them as designed. It is our job to use them in unusual ways to get those unusual results. Um, I hope you've enjoyed my little story. Comments, questions? Not, not from you. Anyone else? Thank you for your time. You've been very kind.